Welcome to Storytelling with Lindsay Bednar. It was, well, it was more of a, I find myself frequently going through different, I mean, I think I've shared this with you before, like I get very triggered online when I see people making fun of my generation and, and what they're doing and, and now, and I know you very proudly rock a side part. Uh, side part. And and yeah, all the way pants. skin tight pants yeah. all the way down. And I still don't I it. don't, right? Like I kowto and I obsess and I think like, Oh my god, are they gonna think I'm like too old? And so, you know, I part my hair in the middle and I get the shadow roots and I get the little curtain bangs and so wide leg like, pants keeps coming on my radar and you know, the algorithms when you start looking at one thing, like now I'm getting all these like fucking Gen Z and they're like, Hey, let me show you how to dress and it's like buy a Chelsea boot everybody's wearing fucking Chelsea boots. I don't even know what Chelsea boots are. They're like the regular boots we've been wearing for the last 10 years, but they just, they're like slightly higher. You know, they've got like the black elastic on the either side. They're like a short hunter boot, kind of, right? They're a little bit thicker sold, but it's like a a modified Doc Martin. If it's a Doc Martin and a hunter boot had a baby, you know, and they're throwing them with everything and everybody's got the Lululemon fanny pack. I bought my Lululemon, it was a fanny pack when I bought it in 2000. 16. Oh no, and, it's a crossbody. And now, now it's a crossbody bag. And it's the same fucking bag, right? But now, like, I can't do that, but I'm trying to, and I'm trying to find the right crop top, and they're all body positive, and I'm like body shamed, and I'm not ready. And like, so I keep trying to shove myself into this new space, and it just like, I order shoes, and I don't like them, and they're too chunky, or they're not flat enough. And then I'm like, well, no, they're Cole Haan, and I don't think think that that's the aesthetic that's supposed to go with the pants that I bought at wet seal but I find myself just very but you're attempting to do it which I'm not I'm I I don't think that's better to be quite fair I don't think that's actually a good (laughs) thing I am attempting to do it and I'm not succeeding (laughs) well I bought my first pair of wide legs and I'm not sure that I wore them correctly but I wore them to a concert so I felt like okay I'll kind of get my feet wet it was a country concert paired them with some boots yeah you know, a uh, t-shirt, like, uh, oh, what do you call it? A shacket? Yeah. Yeah. Which, is no. that what the kids are okay. calling it? They are. And I didn't know that. And all of a sudden, like I'm seeing shackets everywhere. And I found myself at Athleta like two weeks ago. And I'm like, oh, I really like this. But it was a print, right? It's not all black. And I'm like, whoa, what is this? And I'm like, oh my God, it's a shacket. And the woman next to me, I'm like, it's a shacket. Like, are you not here looking for Chelsea boots in a shacket? And she's like 80. And she's like, no, that is not why I'm here. She was apparently not on TikTok earlier the way. I no. was at feeling a lot of like need to go out and validate herself through the eyes of a I don't even know what generation it is it's not like it's not it's not I think it's what are we calling them the I generation X Z wait millennials Gen X Gen Z and then well like I, I don't confused. I need a chart it was interesting I think you you technically fall into the millennial generation right Do like I? depending on where you're like some people say 82 is the cutoff oh, okay. some people say 80 yep um and I being an 80 like I very and I identify as a generation xer right like it we just we were a different and I, I think you might feel that same way too right like we we're a little more latchkey we we're just a little more like we just let people be like, we didn't really give a shit. Like it was fine. We didn't like, you thought different. That's okay. Like we can think you're stupid and we can all just exist. And And it was in a time where like the, the, the grunge Seattle thing was huge. And at the same time you had like Backstreet Boy bands was big and like, all these different kind of just melting pot of genres and clothing. Right. And, and everyone s- just did. Yeah. You still had Aerosmith touring. You still had Bon Jovi. You still had like Peter Gabriel and like the shit our parents listened to. Like, and it could all just coexist. And I mean, we're not even getting into like rap and hip hop and like all right. the things that were like, you yeah, know, Naughty by Nature, up. Salt Peppa, like that whole thing. Yeah. It's just, it's a different, it's a different time it and is. it's a different generation. Those really and- good years. They were now good we really years. Sound old. I try. I try to tell my kids. I try to let my kids live like that a little bit. I try to remind myself that a lot of what happens these days happens more in our head than it does in our reality, and that while things do certainly suck in our reality, 
what we make of it and the way we view things and the way we try to put them out there and the way we shape how they're seeing things that that comes back so if we tell them to be fearful if they go out and that every stranger that wants to talk to them is doing it because they're definitely going to abduct them like that is that is the mindset that they're going to go out there and they're going to be fearful of all of those interactions but i can't tell you how many times you know i as a child like ran around talking to total stranger adults and like it being fine now creepy ones for sure like i met my fair share like and did I know it at the time? No. But like hindsight, you look back and I'm like, oh, that creepy man that wanted to bounce me on his knee at the watering <laughs> hole. Like, that's not normal. And and me wanting to say no, I should have listened to that and said no. But like, you know, he, here we are and I, I survived. And, you know, like that's a good it's a good thing to be able to look back on and say, like, there was danger all around me like many many times and here I sit today and I'm still okay and I learned a few things like definitely if a man at the watering hole asked to bounce <laughs> me on his knee today I feel comfortable in saying no thank you hard pass yeah you know I listened to I think it was on NPR but they did a study of like a small area and I think it was Colorado in the 70s and the what was going on with um, crime and like abductions, anything like that. And they went back and did the same thing and nothing had really changed. Although, you know, when you think about what we see on the news now, it seems like, well, the world is 10 times worse. It's like, well, this stuff has been going on forever, but now we have everything inundated in our faces. Right. And of course, bad news travels quickly and so that's what we see which brings me to why you're here today because I had an interesting conversation yesterday in the sauna and I was telling my friend who actually did helped with the intro of the podcast and I was telling him that you were going to be coming on today and we were going to be um, talking about all things marijuana and this woman was like I'm sorry I just have to insert myself for a minute yes she said so I tried edibles and I thought I was gonna die and we're like okay and kind of giggling and she started telling us her story and she said you know and they're, they're so small and it was just a little one and my heart started racing and I felt like I was having a panic attack yeah she said and you know and then I saw Dr. Phil and he's saying all these things are being laced now and <laughs> um you could just feel definitely the the advice she should be seeking is right yeah yeah and um of course, he was saying, well, yeah, you can misdose yourself with, with anything. anything. Sure. And a lot of people who start experimenting with alcohol as young yeah. adults or teenagers or whatever. Or like 50, they 60, overdo 70 it. year olds. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so I was so excited for you to come because I was, uh, especially after that, because there's so much misinformation yeah. about um, what is available, how it's available, the dangers, the benefits, all of that. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's, why, let's do this. Let's start with how you got into it. Um, I want to know your specific story first. Uh, and, and so people can get to know you and then we'll get into all the, the nuances. All the of nuances. It. I, you know, I, again, like we were raised in the dare era and, you know, I, I can still not, I think it's like drugs aren't right ever, but I'm not exactly sure what, I just know like drugs are bad, right? Like that's, that's what we remember from that. But also at the same time, like having grown up very conservative and, you know, going to public school, not until I was 12, like when I went in, it was like, oh, this is like, this is all around me. Like, oh, this is, you know, this is what they warn you about the kids and they're smoking cigarettes and they're drinking. And it wasn't until I was in 10th grade that I tried cannabis for the first time. And it was, you know, I, I think each year that I was in public school, I, I dipped my toes slightly further into the waters of, you know, I was probably in eighth grade the first time I had a cigarette and probably ninth grade the first time I had a drink. So I think it seems about right that, you know, 10th grade was the first time that, you know, I tried smoking and it was, 
you know, it was really a special experience, you know, my, you know, Patty Bonner, and she was one of my best friends, and she had done it quite a bit. And, you know, was like, no, you really, and I was like, I don't know, because the, I think even as children, the idea of letting go so completely is hard, because again, we teach them don't swing too high, don't jump off of there because it's danger, it's danger, it's danger. And so we naturally have this like, what if, like, what if I'm not in control? But I think it's also some of that that drives us to do those things. Like some of that, like that's where alcohol plays a factor, right? Like, what if I'm not in control? Well, what if I drink so much that I'm not really in control? And then these things that maybe I want to happen that happen, well, I wasn't in control of them, right? So the first time, the first time I tried it, I remember her parents would always go out to the golf club on Friday night. And so we were crouched down. It was like January and her mom smoked so we could smoke pot in the house and she would never smell it. And we crouched down by the back door and it was, you know, it was just sort of like it, it hits you really fast. So for anyone who hasn't ever smoked cannabis, as opposed to like taking an edible or something like that, it's it's an immediate thing. So you you feel it. And for me, I remember it was like, oh, oh like you, I couldn't feel my face. Like it, it was just like, holy shit. Like, OK, OK. And I was with Keisha was with me. And so Patty was going off to do something else. And Keisha took me to her boyfriend's house, Ben Dixon. And we watched Austin Powers. There was like 10 of us there on his waterbed and it was like fucking wild. And I was like, holy (laughs) shit, like this, this is kind of cool. And, you know, it wasn't something that I had a lot of access to. I mean, I was 15. Like I, I don't really have a lot of business like you know, carrying that stuff around. And it was bad. I was already smoking cigarettes all the time anyway, and drinking quite frequently. Um, So it wasn't unusual, I guess, that I would want to add something else to my little like, you know, rebels apothecary. Right. But, you know, I continued to use intermittently, I guess, like as as often as I could. I mean, as often as like any 15 year old kid, 16 year old kid, 17 year old kid gets their hands on in northern Minnesota in the 90s, right? Like, there just wasn't a ton of options. There was like two people I knew at school that I could ask and that was it. Um, and it's interesting because that, you know, there's a whole portion of my life that has always been like chasing drug dealers, if you will, right? Like everywhere I've always lived or been, it's like, well, who's who's going to hook me up? Like, how do I have to know these people? And the places that I've been and the things that I have seen in the pursuit of just trying to get, you know, what is essentially medicine is, I mean, fascinating. When we lived here in Minneapolis, in the late 90s and early 2000s, someone across the hall from us. And we would hear his buzzer ring all the time. And I'm like, he's got to be selling drugs. Like, let come on. Right. And so finally, Let's I'm like, real. Scott, like man up and go over there and ask him if he's selling drugs and if we can buy some. <laughs> And so he did. And I remember he left. And like 30 minutes later, he I mean, he was gone forever. There's no cell phones. He's across the hall. But I'm not going to like, what am I going to call out? No. So I'm sitting there in our apartment. And he comes home. I'm like, well, yes. And he's like, Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that was like, I remember feeling like I had I had won the apartment lottery that a drug dealer moved in across. Like I never had to leave again. But it was so funny because so a Friday night like that soon became like where we hung out all like, because why wouldn't we? Because he's got all of it. But it was this rotation of characters that came in like every Friday, Saturday night, getting their hook up for the weekend. And we would sit there and they would come in and they would. And I, I knew the game well. Right. Because that was me and all of these other scenarios for the last time however many years of me going like, hi, oh, hey, 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 oh, cool. Yeah. What are you guys up to? (laughs) Like, and smoke a little bowl and then like, okay, cool. And then head out. And we would do that like 10, 12 (laughs) times a night. And usually by like 1030, I'm like, I'm out. I'm done. Like, I'm just, there's, I got nothing left Mm -hmm. in me for this. Uh, But it was fun because you got to meet a lot of different people and you got to realize I think that was the first time I understood how many different people used it for all the same reason. They all just want to feel good, which is essentially why most people do most things. Right. 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 Um, But this is a way that people had, you know, specifically tapped into with all different things. Right. Whether they have anxiety, whether they have Crohn's disease, whether they have cancer, all of these different things can be treated by like one 
miraculous plant. And that's, I think, the idea behind that is what really drove me to want to dive further into the plant, into the science, into how it interacts in our body, because that blows my mind. It blows my mind that one thing can do all of these things for all of these people, and they're different things. Like, how does our body intuitively know this is what it needs? And that leads me into, you know, really, we were talking about this a little bit before, not understanding our bodies. Like, yes, we all had health class. Yes, we understand we have a skeletal system, a muscular system, all of, you know, we know our organs, but do we really know our bodies? Do we understand how they work together? Do we know how the brain signals? Do we understand how the gut and the head are connected? Do we understand how our nervous system regulates? Do you know you have a lymphatic system? Is there, you know, so the endocannabinoid system is one of, they don't teach that in medical school. And you have an entire system in your body that is designed to accept cannabinoids. And our body makes cannabinoids. The same common element that we find in the cannabis plant, our body makes. We make endocannabinoids, plants make photocannabinoids. And so it's it's part of our biological DNA. And it's interesting because we fight so hard against something that nature's given us for a reason, right? Like the same way I'm sure when we have vitamin D in our body, it doesn't mean we don't need the sun. You're not born with an infinite, you know, unlimited amount of it. No, you have to re-uptake and keep getting more of that. And so I think the idea that our body has a system, our body makes it, but our body also seeks it out is something that, at least for me, assures me that that it is in the right direction like this is what was intended when when god created all the miraculous things on earth i i truly believe he put them there for a for purpose a and that's what i was just going to say too because whether you are a spiritual person and believe in god which i know both you and i do um but even if you're a scientific person you believe that things were put on this earth right. for a purpose yeah and so the f- mere fact that it exists, we all have to agree that there is a purpose for it. And I think if we can at least start on that same page, then we can start to really understand, okay, what are the various purposes? Like, let's, let's get rid of the stigma that's been there for so long, right? Because it was illegal, which is really where the stigma probably comes from. Well, and so it's interesting because where the stigma comes from. So prior to the 1930s, say the turn of the century, it was in 50% of the pharmacopoeia that people had in their households that were stocked in pharmacies contained cannabis. Like it's not anything new. It's nothing. Um, like people at home had cannabis yes. in there, like they would Advil or... And cough syrup. Yep. And I mean, the same way they oh. had like codeine and cocaine and right. things like that. Like we used to, all of the things now that we're so scared of that did come from nature, um, that we don't allow mass access to. And I, I think that's fine. Like, I, I don't think everybody should have mass access to all of this. Uh-huh. Um, but they were common. That was what cough syrup was. That's what all of these different things. So half of the medications that people took at that time had cannabis in them. So that just to set that marker, that was the turn of the century. So a lot of things happened then. You had all of the all of the big magnets of industry were rising then. So you had oil magnets and you had shipping magnets and you had lumber magnets. And one of the biggest threats to lumber as a whole is hemp because hemp hemp is a renewable resource. And hemp, you can grow probably six crops a year, four to six crops a year, and and harvest them and utilize the fibers and turn it into paper. And you can do that over and over and over. You don't have to wait 30 years for trees to grow to pull them down. So around the turn of the century, when you started seeing all of these, these certain individuals taking over large portions of industry in the United States, one of them was the the lumber industry lobbying against the cannabis industry because hemp fiber was such a threat. So our founding wow. fathers, they they had hemp. They were all farmers of hemp. It's, it's in all of the history documents. If you look, it was required actually that they grow hemp because it's such an important crop. It's been used as currency uh, as far back as like the 1400s. It, if you trace its origins, it goes back the Silk Road from China. It was one of the eight crops that was moved all through throughout India and Eastern Europe. Wow. Like it has a very 
rich history that everybody ignores because of the last hundred years, everything that's happened. So you take that time and they say, we don't want hemp because that's a threat to what we're doing with paper. And and sorry to interrupt no, real quick. What is what is the difference between hemp and cannabis? Yeah. So it's all cannabis. That's, it's okay. all cannabis. It's the different types is the distinction. So it cannabis sativa is the all encompassing plant. And this is where it gets difficult, especially in markets where we live in. There is marijuana is, is what we call it. And that's that contains Delta nine THC and marijuana is as we would we would get into through this whole thing, it's a it's a, a racist term that was coined in the 1930s to describe Mexicans who used cannabis, and you didn't want to use cannabis like the lazy Mexicans, the marijuana that they used, and there was a whole like wow. propaganda that went around like. They they made it illegal first, and then you could only have it by prescription. And the only people who could get prescriptions were upper class people, and so they had they always had access to the medicine, but no one else could get it unless you bought it on the street. And you bought it on the street from, you know, the the people that came here that were the unsavory people. So it's I mean, there's there's a much darker and deeper history than that. And that is definitely like the whitewashing of it. But that's where the term marijuana comes from. And so otherwise, you would use the term hemp. So really, okay. it's, it's easy to, to put it in two categories. So this is THC dominant, and this is CBD dominant. So hemp is you know, the CD, CBD dominant, that's a cannabinoid. So like it, it gets into, there's a lot of different things. It's, it's not so easy as to just say like cannabis is good or bad because there is so many nuances to it. So hemp has CBD in it, which is something that our body uses. This is really interesting. It stops our body from breaking down two endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG. So we have happiness in our body in terms of these enzymes. And so CBD stops stops it from breaking down. So it helps us retain more of our happy, good feeling enzymes. And you'll feel that a little bit more in your body. You feel like there's inflammation that goes down, swelling, that sort of thing. That's how we think of CBD. THC, those, it reacts with the receptors more in your brain. And so that's more of like where our head high, that's why it's psychoactive. They work in your whole body. You have um, CB1 and CB2 receptors everywhere all over your body, particularly around your organs. Um, I've got some beautiful sh charts that I, I like to show people about it. But it's really interesting when you see how your body is designed. So that's why when we were talking before about like why it works for someone who has cancer, why does it work for someone who has headaches? Why does it do all of these things? And yeah, and it's so universal. And to a certain extent, no, it's not. You have different strains will do different things. And that's a whole different subject. But it's because our bodies are designed to accept it the same way. Like if you hurt your foot and I have a headache and we both take an aspirin, our body's receptors are saying, hi, look at me. I need help. I need help. And then as soon as the cannabis and the cannabinoids enter your body and they're charging through, they're looking for those receptors saying like, hi, this is this is the problem. And then they can deliver the medicine. Wow. Yeah. So how does that work with people who use it particularly for, say, anxiety? You have to find the right combination. And so, you know, that's why legalization, I think, is the single biggest driver to having people effectively use, cannab use cannabis is because you don't know what you're taking if you're not buying it from someplace that's been tested. And there's a whole nother level to that about even if it is tested, right, let's start caring about what we're finding in there. Like, you know, like, let's start caring about the soil, like the same way we care about our food being organic and our right. chickens being free range, like, give a shit where you're cannabis comes from find out right. what kind of inputs they're putting in it what how are they controlling for pests like what are they doing in terms of storage and all of that sort because it matters like quality matters and we've lived in such a gray area for so long and people are just so desperate to get access to the medicine they need they will take anything that they can get 
but it's sad because there's so much more effective ways of treating people if you can target them based on, you know, certificates of analysis telling you this is high in mercy. And so somebody who's got a lot of pain or somebody who needs some sleep relief, let's make sure that they get it. And hey, I realize, you know, if you commingle that with a little bit of terpenaline, it has like this great anti-anxiety effect. Okay. So now when I go into a dispensary, I can say, well, you know, I've noticed that when I, you know, typically when you go into a dispensary, they're like, well, what are you looking for? Sativa or indica? And those, you know, yeah, break that down for, yeah. Like those, those are, I think a great, when, when we couldn't, describe cannabis any other way. That was a a fine way of describing them. And generally speaking, you know, when strains were pure and nothing had been crossbred and bastardized, there was probably a certain amount of like, yes, sativas will make you a little more energized and indicas will make you a little sleepier because typically these are more myrcene dominant and these are perhaps more caryophylline dominant or there's, you know, always those rules of perhaps, but it's, it's, been crossbred for so long and there's not pure bud line. So really when I think of indica and sativa, I think of the way the leaf sh- look. Some, you know, like sativas are long and skinny. Indicas are short and fat. One takes longer to flower. One is on a shorter cycle. They're really about the characteristics of the plant rather than the effects of the plant. So if you okay. go to a good dispensary and you say, do you have certificates of analysis that will break down what's in the product for you? And you can tell them, I know that my body reacts really well too. There are about 15 common terpenes that you'll find in most uh, cannabis plants. Then you can say, I'd like something myrcene dominant. I'm looking for something for sleep. And then they can point you in that direction. So it helps you be more informed as a consumer what you're looking for. But to your point earlier, a lot of it's trial and error. We don't know how it's going to work with our body the same way, you know, the first time I drank a bottle of tequila, I didn't know <laughs> what was going to happen. And it wasn't good, but it didn't stop me from drinking, right? Like I don't really drink tequila so much anymore. <laughs> But it didn't, I didn't swear off alcohol. And that's, you know, to your story of the woman in the sauna earlier, like there are so many people that have had these horrible experiences and they're like, I can't. And I'm like, come on now. Like, are we all that big of quitters? No. Like, (laughs) but to their credit here, take for example, like my mother-in-law was here a couple weeks ago and she said she wanted to get some edibles. And I said, well, go, go see my friend Bridget in St. Paul. Like she's got a beautiful shop there. She does all her own hash rosin. Like it's really good stuff. And she's like, well, I don't want to go into the city. So I'm like, it's fine. Scott, take her to the strip mall over there and see what you got. So she goes to a vape shop in the strip mall. Okay. And you know, here you can buy these edibles anywhere, literally anywhere. Right. And she comes back and she's, She's like, I said, you know, give me the strongest thing you've got, because that's how most people buy cannabis. They just, they fuck me up. Uh, I got 20 bucks. What can you show me for a good time? And I was like, Linda, I don't even know what this is. Like there's, there's five milligrams of Delta nine. There's three cannabinoids that I've never heard of. And I can guarantee are, you know, chemically synthesized in a lab. There's, you know, this, which I know is not good. And it's 3,500 milligrams of like, you don't know what. And you're taking this and every like people just keep taking these things and they're like, I didn't I didn't like it. It didn't work. I felt weird. And I'm like, well, because you didn't know what you were taking because you were taking a low quality product because you're taking, you know, like it's like the Shasta of <laughs> cannabis. It you just yeah, the off brand. You got to know. And legalization is what helps people know. Right. So typically when you'd go to like a vape vape shop or there's the CBD places popping up all over and they sell a lot of edibles. Those ones are typically... They're typically not, they're not tested. They're not regulated. I'm not saying there's not a lot of good players out there because there certainly are. There are people who are doing it correctly, but you don't know. There's no testing required. There's no requirements for product safety. The only requirement that they really have is that you are supposed to card that people are over 21 to purchase them. Right. Like okay. it's, it's, it's a wild area here and that's, right now. That's specifically in Minnesota. That is actually the interesting thing. Specifically in Minnesota, we're limited to five milligrams of Delta 9 THC as long as it's hemp derived, no more than 50 in the package. Uh, most states, you'll see a standard 100 milligram package. So it's half that amount. But the interesting thing is that 
prior to the specific law in Minnesota, the Farm Bill, which is effective in all 50 states, states that you can have any product as long as the dry weight of the product contains less than 0.3% Delta 9 THC. So in essence, if I have a giant bundle of CBD and I go process it, as long as the dry weight of it had less than 0.3% THC, I can take that THC and I can do whatever I want with it. I could put it into a thousand milligram gummy if I was so inclined, as long as the dry weight of it equaled that. So there are shops all over the country that have been operating very quietly doing this, selling mostly 10 milligrams because that's a very standard dose of THC for most people. Because I, I knew people that were doing it here, you know, prior to. So this actually, this new law lessens it for them. But it does probably bring in more customers because now people you know, know that it's legal. Right. And oh, they are okay with it. Right. It just even changing the language of the legality. Mm-hmm. People that I found are so like low key curious. I mean, Uh, suburban moms to seniors to everybody but there's there still is this societal stigma right where they're like well I don't want to go to a store and buy it and I don't know what I'm doing and I have you know our our mutual friends in up north like they're like I would never go to the vape shop to buy it like I would die if someone saw my car at the vape shop (laughs) and I'm like oh okay like (laughs) park around back i don't like wear a fucking mask like put it to good use but it does i mean uh, because that is how everybody's operating it makes people you know worried about just being curious about it and i one of the reasons why i wanted to have you on is because and i think i probably said this in another recording too but one of my favorite quotes that my sister says a lot is when we are our authentic selves, we give other people permission to do so. And so just you, first of all, you're wildly crazy educated about all of this. Thank you. And so that it's like so fascinating to hear. But then also just to um, have like, let people know that it's okay to be curious to know that, that um, this is extremely helpful for people in a lot of various ways. And just like anything, you approach it with uh, being educated about it and and knowing your limitations and what what works for you, just as you would when you're drinking or, you know. Well, and you said curiosity, like that is really the way to approach most things with, like we get so stuck on this, like I want to do this or I'm going to do this. Like, no, it's okay to say I'm curious about this and like dabble and learn a little bit. And then if you think like, it's not for me, like, it's like no, no hard feelings, but like just being curious about different things and seeing the path that it leads you, you know, I, I write a lot of things down and I write them down in lots of different places and I get post-its everywhere, but sometimes I try to make sense of it all and I put it in little pieces and I do that with my life sometimes too. And I think about all the different pieces of it coming together. And there really is a big, beautiful picture that you, you don't see in the moment, right? Like you just keep doing the things and that's sort of how I go through life. I just keep doing the things that are in front of me that I think I'm supposed to be doing. And I know that eventually I'll get where I'm supposed to be. And really knowing where I'm supposed to be is right here, right now makes it that I'm not always waiting. Like I know there's greater things. I know there's bigger things, but I can appreciate in the here and now that I have the things that are here and approach the rest of it, not with what I have to do or what I expect myself to do, but a curiosity around what I can do. Like what else could there be out there? And like, if this isn't the way it goes, like that's okay, but there's a little piece that I needed from that that leads me over here. And so not saying like, oh, that didn't work out how I want it. Well, no, but it gave me something because each little thing gives you a little piece along the way. For sure. And I, uh, that has led you into, you've started your own business. I've, had, I've got a couple businesses, actually. Okay. So I have a consulting firm with two of my fellow certified gone GAs. And the goal that That's we have title. behind that, yeah, so a, a certified gone GA is a cannabis sommelier, for lack of a better term. The beer beer people have Cicerones, we've got cheesemongers, we've got chocolatiers. So in the world of cannabis, a gone GA is someone who can guide you through your journey of cannabis. So it was a 10 
10 sections of a course that I took online over the course of about three months and then made two trips out to Northern California to do live assessments and go through the real, the nuts and the bolts and the feel and the smell. Because, you know, again, when we say cannabis today, it, it is so all encompassing. And a lot of it nowadays is consumer product goods. That's cannabis 3.0. But what I'm really talking about most of the time is the flower, like the actual, like good old smoking weed, like grind it up and smell it and touch it and do all of those things. So there's a hundred point scale, very similar to a wine sommelier that we look at all of the different characteristics, the aroma, the taste, the appearance, the effects, and all of that rolls into one, one score that we can give it to help customers find some value in the market because there's not a lot of clarity around what is good quality and what people are looking for. So it's, It's been sort of an act of service, I think, for me, pulling this group of people together. So I have my two business partners, and we've got 65 uh, independent contractors that work underneath us that are all certified Gangiers, that are all sort of finding their place in the world, because education is really important to all of us. And like you said, the more people know, the more they understand, the more they're ready to like let a little bit of into their life. Right. Um, And so that's, that's really our collective mission is to go out there to educate people to empower the community. So uh, right now I've been doing a series of educational events. We're going to be at the Oklahoma Cowboy Cup at the beginning of December, doing four different panels on everything from solventless concentrates, which is that we, we won't even have time to go there. Uh, um, but like legacy, uh, legacy cultivators and all of the people who've spent the last hundred years making sure that we still have access to the plant. Women in cannabis, because they are, you know, 75% of household spending and they are, you know, 3% of what cannabis companies market to. There's a huge gap there. And then I have a large mass consumption event where we, because it's Oklahoma and it's the fucking wild, wild west, that you can have a tent with 100 people in it and have them all go through that 100 point assessment and learn how to look for quality and then all just get high in a big tent. Wow. Um, so that's that's in December and a couple more next year. So I've been working with a gentleman by the name of Patrick King, and he's quite the character, um, but he's been a legacy cultivator for 50 plus years. And so he has a number of other people that have been working with him and is taking his legends of legacy tour out into different parts of the United States in 2023. We're going to be in Missouri, which just legalized. We're hoping to get to Maryland, which just legalized. And then the entire eastern seaboard, like New York, Vermont, New Jersey, all of those, you know, they have new legal markets that aren't quite up and running. They're operating in a very interesting gray space, um, but hoping to get out there to be able to do some of them too. So I spend a lot of time doing, you know, speaking and advocacy work on that end. But then I also have a program that I'm going to be launching in January that will start at the end of February that is called Canna Basics. And it's a six-week course that is, you know, you'll have a 30-minute lesson that's delivered to you in your inbox that you can watch. And then five days later, you can join a live Zoom to go through that information with me. And we'll have a special guest each week that will help you understand it. So I found when I was learning, I would always have questions, right? Because I'm I'm just very curious. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, who am I going to ask my questions to? And, you know, because nothing, nothing is an accident. I met a woman on Instagram who was also in the program and she was like, do you want to have us like a study group? And I was like, oh yeah, like we should. And so uh, she and I started and then we had two people and then we had three people and here we are almost two years later and we've got 164 people that every Monday I lead a call that has a different subject matter expert. And so we talk about everything today was about, uh, it was brand building basics. And so one of our certified Gangiers is also a digital marketer. So he put together this great presentation about like, how do you build your brand? Because you've got people who've been growing up in the hills for, you know, 50 years. And they're like, the fuck is the internet? Like, (laughs) I don't like just buy my weed. And it's like, Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Like, that's not a marketing strategy. (laughs) Let me show you. So it just it, things like that. I'm trying yeah. to think. Last week we had a lawyer who came on and talked to us about cannabis law and you know the difference between you know people get you know people are like legalized and everybody in cannabis is like 
yeah, can we talk about that? Can we just talk about descheduling? Actually, like we need to change because, and again, a whole nother thing. But you know, the government bought the patents on cannabis a hundred years ago. So like that's the kicker to all of this is like they own the rights to it, and like so um. it's all. You know, like it's all one of those things that like eventually when it gets legal, they'll have the patent on a lot of things. And then, you know, who knows, who knows what will Got happen it. from there. But legalization brings that descheduling allows it to just be a commodity the same way we farm other agricultural crops. And so I think that's what a lot of people in the cannabis industry, we don't want it to be another highly regulated, highly taxed product like alcohol, like tobacco, they, you know, we're looking for it to be something you can grow and like, we should have home grow rights, we should be able to have four plants that accessible. we're growing in our basement that we know have clean inputs that we know that our pest control methods are organic, that we hang to dry, we cure in our home. And that's, you know, like, we know what we're growing. We don't have that in most places, even in places like California that used to be patient focused when they had Prop 64 and they approved medical cannabis, the first state in the country. Like it was it truly was for patients of cancer and AIDS like that's what that's what gave birth to the modern cannabis movement was really the the 70s and the 80s and all of that culminating with the AIDS outbreak and people using cannabis to help alleviate those symptoms. So when they when they started medical in can in California, it, it was all about patients and it was all about these cooperatives and people grew and they sold them to, um, you know, wholesalers. And it was it was really touching what was going on and and now you fast forward and what you've got is all of these big corporations coming in and it's a race to the bottom because it's not about the patients anymore it's about getting their share of the market and because you don't have interstate commerce your market even though it's california and it's the biggest market i mean it's like the sixth largest economy in the world it is still limited to that and you see other countries like canada and israel and they can export and we can't do any of that so you have a market that just keeps overproducing and it drives the price down so the people who you know let's say they're up in the hills and they want to come down and they want to brand their beautiful craft cannabis that they used to be getting $5,000 a pound for, they're coming down the hill. They have no marketing plan. They've got nothing. And they're lucky if they can get $500 a pound for it. Like it's just the market has been decimated. And you see that in states like Oklahoma and states like Michigan and where it happens over and over and over that because you can't have interstate commerce, because you can't let the supply and demand flux the way it's supposed to, you just have all of these dropping prices and it's pricing out all of these legacy operators and all of the people who want to go into the legal market, but they can't afford to because of all the licensing and the taxing and the regulations. And so as we go into each of these new states that are looking at them, say Missouri, even I think both of the Dakotas had them on the ballot, it's really important that people who understand the plant and how it's supposed to be grown and how it's supposed to be used be the one who are in there advocating for the laws, writing the laws, making sure that those things are in there, because otherwise you have people who don't know, they don't have a relationship with the plant and they just see it as, you know, a problem and, and they will govern as such. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a wide range of different things. And I think I got completely off topic because what I was trying to say is a six week course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll come back to that. Yeah. No, so it's it's a six week course and it teaches you the beginning of it is really teaching you about your body because like I said, there's such a huge disconnect between what we think we know and actually how our bodies work. And you know, so I think nutrition is one of those things that we are learning so much more about and it's not just calories in and calories right. out, right? It makes a difference if you're weight training versus running and you know, food we're learning like a tomato, a non organic tomato and an organic tomato, like very, very different things. And so one thing cannabis has taught me is like, I, I don't understand my body and I don't necessarily understand how all of these things work together. I don't know how my enzymes work. I don't have a great handle on my hormones. There are so much room. And so I, you know, again, like just being very curious, I spend a lot of time poking, poking around and just, you know, seeing what that's all about. Um, and it's, you know, helped me to have a much better understanding of how my body works 
works. And therefore, I can now understand like how it accepts cannabis better and how I can have a better relationship with the plant just in terms of being mindful when I'm using it, using it for specific reasons and targeted reasons and things sure. like that. So I want people to be able to have a place to explore that too and to understand first and foremost, what is this going to do to me, right? We talked a little early, it's hard to give up that control. Right. Um, so understanding like, oh, it's going to make me jittery. It might make me nervous. It might make me excited, it, it, but that's okay. Like you're in a place where other people have done that. And if you have a question about that, you can ask that. If you don't understand how inhalation works versus an edible, like that's important to know too, because you know, your body has a liver right. and it has to go through there and then it goes to your stomach and then it gets broken up and it turns into a completely different compound. Then it's 11 uh, hydroxy THC and that's much stronger. That has tiny little particles that can break the blood brain barrier. It's important to know, but until you know your body, you don't understand why all of this matters. So and you might not feel the edible kick in as you would yes. smoking a joint and then which you double dip, which is immediate. So it's, it's helping to get people through that, right? And then starting to understand, we talked a little bit about cannabinoids. We talked a little bit about terpenes. We didn't really get into those. So it's a deep dive into what those are. Okay, so am I going to take THC? Am I going to take CBD? Am I going to take CBN, CBG? Do I want THC? Oh, you know, T right. Delta 8? I don't know. And like my mother-in-law, she's like, I don't know. And on honestly, I don't know what the fuck that was either. But let me teach you how to read a package. Let me teach you what to look for. Let, let you go in there empowered and say, I know what I want. Can you meet me? Okay. So with, with the education that, and, and the discussions that you guys have, the education you bring forward, people can be better equipped to purchase something, even if they've never tried anything before. Well, and, and the caregiver market is something that I think is extremely important because we have a whole generation, an aging generation that are on a ton of, you know, petrochemical pharmaceuticals. And the idea that there could be these things that help them, but, you know, like a lot of kids our age are like, I don't know if I like, do I really have any business telling my parents to try pot? Like, no, but you can go to them, you know, as I have to my parents and said, let me, let me help you understand like this, this is a nice one to one ratio. And, you know, I, 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 it makes me happy when they come to me and they're like, do you have anything in a, and I'm like, oh, yes, yeah. I do. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes, I do. Right. But Letting people have a safe place to ask questions about that and understand how it works and then go in and be an informed consumer and say like, yes, this is what I'm looking for and, and teach them, you know, like you can write it down too and like try this and write down how you feel. And if you don't like it, don't try it again and try something different and then see how you feel. It's not, you, you don't always hit it out of the park the first time. You got to just give it a little bit to, to see how it goes. Yeah. What are there certain myths, misnomers that continually come up? Any that we haven't covered that you see people have misunderstandings um, about? I mean, I think it being, you know, the idea that it's a, a gateway drug is one of the the ones that's harder to dispel. What I always say is, you know, people will accuse stoners of tuning out, right? And I think using it intentionally, it helps me tune in. Like it helps me relax. It, it helps me think, okay, what I'm doing in this moment, am I doing this because I feel like I have to? Am I doing this because I want to? Is this coming from a place of need? Like I, I allow myself to have those moments when I consume and try and have focus and purpose behind them. And I'm not saying everybody does, and I'm not saying that's every single time either, but it, it really boils down to, again, the relationship that you have with the plant. And there are some people who smoke on Friday nights and there's nothing wrong with that. And there are some people who wake up at 5 a.m. and will rip their vape pen and they'll go upstairs and they'll take a dab and they'll still function in society. Like that's just how they show up. And it's hard because we so often use the comparison of alcohol, which is a terrible one, because we can't be like, well, no, obviously Susie needs to drink three glasses of wine before she gets up in the morning because her body needs it. like, no, it doesn't quite work like that. We don't have right. an endo alcohol system. Right. But there are people who legitimately need 100 milligrams to get out of bed. And so I think the hardest part is people saying because that 
dosage is too high for me, that person is abusing it. Mm. It, mm-hmm. We're all different, yeah. You know, so I think that's people. The judgment over how other people use it, like if somebody's lying in a, a gutter and can't get out of it, like fine, like there you can probably have a little bit of judgment around that, just you know, because they're not again, like not functioning, yeah, in yeah. society. That's that's a tough one, but you know, the people getting up every day, like if if they have to use it because it helps them, if it helps them be clearer, if it helps them be more present, if it helps them be more loving, like, are we really like, do we really care how people get there these days? If there are any of these things who are like, right? Well, and there, what is the difference between someone who takes a pharmaceutical medication every day for anxiety purposes to help them function versus taking plant based medicine? And when you look at the litany of possible adverse effects from pharmaceuticals, Mm -hmm. I would hope people would be at least open to looking at cannabis for the, the same usage. The interesting thing about all those pharmaceuticals is the all like you said, all the side effects and and all of the side effects have like this great cure of more pharmaceuticals, right? Like right. It's, it's a really great <laughs> yeah. system. It may cause heartburn, <laughs> but look, I can give you this. But here's some ass effects for that, and I understand that that might cause you insomnia, but that's okay because I can give you this for right. that. Okay. Um, and that's I think one of the beautiful things is there is you know, all kinds of different cannabis and you can find the right medicine still, still in that realm. And then I, you know, throw in a push for psychedelics too, but I'm not sure most people are ready for that. Oh, well, that can be a whole (laughs) other episode. Absolutely. That is a whole other episode. All right. I got to run. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, before you go, I, know, I feel like I didn't actually tell any good stories, though. No, this well, this was super informative, good. and so, uh, uh, and I want to meet again because we this was literally just touching on the the yeah, it scratches the surface, and I, I think that's a good introductory for most people. So let's let everybody know where they can find you and we'll you can find me on Instagram at the Sage Ganjie or at Certified Cannabis Consultants. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited for you and you're a wealth of information. This was so much fun. Thank you. We'll have you back for sure. Anytime. All right. Love you, lady. Love you. 